China is by far the world's biggest risk right now. Why are bond yields all over the planet screaming lower? In part because of fears that what's happening in China might spill over everywhere else. Start with an economy that fails time and again to respond to government efforts to turn the situation around. You have to ask why, and the answer isn't necessarily Chinese. And that's only where it begins. We got financial problems, real estate woes, and increasingly political intrigue and geopolitics too. Taiwan, anyone? Even Xi Jinping in his New Year's address had to admit not everything there is rainbows and kittens. For the first time since he started, started giving them back in 2013, she actually addressed the possibility that China's economy isn't as robust as he always says it is. In that address, he started out by saying, the Chinese economy has sustained the momentum of recovery. Having weathered the storm, the Chinese economy is more resilient and dynamic than ever before. I mean, resilient. Doesn't everyone say that when it's whether it's resilient or not? It's like they all use the same PR firm. But also, but she also said, no matter how the global landscape may evolve, peace and development remain the underlying trend, and only cooperation for mutual benefit can deliver. Along the way, we are bound to encounter headwinds. Never said that before. Some enterprises had a tough time. Some people had difficulty finding jobs and meeting basic needs. That's not something the Chinese leadership ever admits about their own economic situation. It's as if some staffer in Xi Jinping's large staff said, hey, we probably should at least address this growing issue of economic trouble in China because 2023 did not go as everyone had planned. It did go the way lower bond yields and inverted curves had been saying. So while central banks around the world were afraid of inflation and pushing short-term interest rates up, their short-term interest rate benchmarks up, bond markets were saying, no, things are going more wrong than right, starting with China. And while Xi Jinping talks a really good game, at least in the flower language he uses, despite the fact that he admitted not everything went great last year, you do also have to wonder how confident he actually is in private and in his actions rather than just what he says in public addresses. Because there was a report at the end of December from Nikkei that more than raised eyebrows here. The title of the report was China's Spy Agency Now Watches for Doomsayers. With increasing power over economic security, the ministry hints at, crack, at crackdowns. And it goes, it goes on to quote an economist, an unnamed economist, who asked, how strange that China's economic policies for next year, ones that have just been adopted, were first explained by the Ministry of State Security. And the implication is the Chinese are once again cracking down, maybe even harder, on those who admit the truth here that China's economy is not responding to all of these doses of stimulus that are failing to stimulate the situation. The economy that's supposed to be turning around and recovering, as she said in his part of his address, is not turning around. In fact, the recent data that we've got today, to go over today, indicates it continues to get weaker and weaker and weaker, no matter what the government throws at it. And that includes the real estate and property sector. So China's economy, starting with the economy, is a huge risk, not just for China, but how China responds to it moving forward and how the global economy responds to it. Even the mainstream media in the U.S. has finally started to pick up on the fact that China is not going to be some source of strength. In fact, as I have been saying all year, pay attention to bond yields, China was more likely to be a drag on global growth as a contributor to the economy staying out of recession. Here's CNN just recently. The Chinese economy was expected to recover quickly in 2023 and resume its role as the undisputed engine of global growth. Well, that's the myth that everybody starts with. That's the myth that has been perpetuated for how many years now? And there's no truth to it. China hasn't been the engine of global growth. That has been the euro dollar way of doing business. And ever since 2008, when it broke down, the entire global growth 
paradigm change. And it changed dramatically for China. That is where its real estate problems actually come from. When the Chinese economy got faced with the problems in 2008, it responded to them the way many economists said to respond to them everywhere with the Keynesian textbook stimulus. And the Chinese unleashed a tidal wave of credit creation. The government got involved in that credit creation, in fact, demanding a lot of it. And the result was a big, the beginning of a big real estate bubble that the Chinese were okay with because Keynesian stimulus all says, just wait for the recovery to happen. Yeah, you're gonna rack up a bunch of debts, but it's better to rack up a bunch of debts in, the, in waiting for recovery to happen than to not do anything and imperil the recovery. But what happens when there is no recovery? Suddenly you get this real estate bubble that starts getting out of control and you no longer have the economic growth to pay for it down the road because that's what you need the recovery for. You're racking up tons of debt. You're creating a tons of stuff that you don't actually need, including properties, developing those all in the expectation that the economy is going to come roaring back and this temporary imbalance that you've just created won't be that big of a deal to clean up. A booming economy solves all problems. But if you create a real estate bubble where the economy doesn't boom, now you've really got a major intractable issue. And so China over the last decade plus has been trying to deal with the fact its economy is not recovering because the global economy never recovered. Silent depression. They created a real estate bubble and then nurtured the real estate bubble and made it a little bigger, hoping that one of these years a recovery was going to actually happen. One of these years a Western QE was actually going to work when Western QEs don't work. Recovery never came. Not just here, but also for the Chinese. So they're left with an economy that continues to ratchet lower and lower and lower. At the same time, the real estate bubble gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Finally, when the pandemic, Xi Jinping said, maybe we should do something about this real estate bubble because it's pretty clear the economy's never going to come back. And that's what has brought us to today. So finally, the Western mainstream media that has been convinced China's this engine of global growth and has been strong forever, it's not actually about China. Now they're seeing the effects on China. Instead, it's stalled to the point where it's being called a drag on world output by the International Monetary Fund, among others. They're coming to the realization that at least for China, yeah, silent depression. But it gets worse. Here's the thing. Despite its many problems, a property crisis, weak spending, and high youth unemployment, most economists think the world's second largest economy will hit its official growth target of around 5% this year, which is all just manipulation. In this case, they manipulated the deflator on GDP in the third quarter to get real GDP up to a point where it was realistic they'll hit their growth target for all of last year. But you look at nominal GDP and the problem becomes very, very clear. Continuing here with CNN. But that is still below the 6% plus annual growth average in the decade before the COVID pandemic, which was not good. 6 plus percent is bad for China. And 2024 is increasingly looking ominous, they said, that the economists, the country may be staring at decades of stagnation thereafter. Bond yields, stagnation, silent depression. China is a reflection of what bond yields have been saying all along, and that is the post-2008 world never recovered and currently has no pathway to recover. So as interest rates are going lower again, as I mentioned in my last video, it's because the world remains stuck in that post-2008 deflationary environment. And more and more, China is showing you the symptoms of that deflationary environment, even in the 2020s. Even moving forward to the middle part of the 2020s, China's economic woes all begin and all go back to 2008. But as more time passes and nothing changes, the risks of it all coming apart increase. And I don't just mean economy. And I don't just mean finance. I don't necessarily mean a banking crisis. That brings us into the political and geopolitical realm too. As far as China's economy is concerned, that's pretty easy and simple. The Chinese were expecting that reopening would open the door 
for a potential recovery in 2023. But what they were really counting on is the global economy at least coming back somewhat from its awful 2022, the major risks and the recessions that developed at the end of 2022. So they were counting on global disinflation to create a little bit more spending room, which would then help China kickstart its own reopening processes. But as we know, the reopening processes were weak, weaker than anticipated to begin with, and the global economy really didn't offer that much of a boost, even though it went through a disinflationary rebound anyway. So by mid-year, the Chinese said, we can't wait for reopening to happen because it's not happening. As the IMF said, China's looking more and more worse to the point that it's going to be a drag on the global economy. The Chinese understood the risks too. So they began manipulating the currency and intervening there. There was a 31-point plan in July. There were FX uh, interventions, more government borrowing, encouraged government borrowing, demanded government borrowing, central government borrowing for fiscal stimulus. And through all of it, Chinese economy does not respond. There have been some responses in certain commodities like iron and steel because the Chinese are going to be building a whole bunch of stuff nobody needs. But as far as the economy is concerned, the government building a whole bunch of stuff that nobody needs doesn't really change the overall situation there or around the rest of the world. Over this past weekend, the New Year's weekend, before Xi Jinping ever talked, ever gave his address, the NBS reported on the latest PMIs for the month of December 2023, the last of last year. And they were not good, predictably not good. And maybe maybe they played a role in convincing Xi Jinping he needed to say something about the economy because it's pretty clear by now reopening was a complete dud and thus far China's efforts to stabilize the situation aren't paying off. China's manufacturing PMI, the official one for the month of December was just 49 and that's down from 49.4. Remember it had been 52.6 way back in February when everybody was convinced reopening was living up to the hype. Well, that didn't last. And here we are at the end of 2023 in worse shape in China than when 2023 began. How can that possibly be? That's the question you need to keep coming back to. New orders continue to contract at a faster rate and Maybe the biggest one of all, because remember, China's economy is still heavily reliant on manufacturing and industry. Despite all of this decade-long attempt to rebalance the economy toward more of a Western-style consumer-driven system, they're still hugely reliant on manufacturing and exports. Export orders, according to the government's PMI for December, 45.8, another ridiculous low, showing that demand from the rest of the world for manufactured goods continues to sink with the lack of a Christmas season that went the way we wanted it to, the inventory cycle that's likely accelerating further to the downside. Again, we start 2024 in worse shape than we began 2023 because there isn't any hype on the horizon that we could at least hang on to for sentimental reasons. More concerning still, of course, China's non-manufacturing or services sector. Though the services PMI, non-manufacturing PMI, improved in December, it didn't actually improve. It just went a little bit higher. It got to 50.4 from 50.2. And the 50.2 in November had been the 11-month low, which was among the worst in the series. So the 50.4 for December is likewise among the worst in the entire series and not really much different from November. Again, no real response from China's government's efforts. And remember March of 2023, the 58.2 in the non-manufacturing PMI, distant memory by this point, only goes to show how little impact or how little lasting impact that reopening actually had, just as the bond market had warned us all year. In addition to soft, weak, not good PMIs suggesting China's economy continues to deteriorate, though I'm allowed to say that since I don't live in China and China's state security councils, maybe they're going to knock on my door and tap my internet, but I'm allowed to say China's economy is deteriorating because that's what all the numbers are showing. And it gets even worse when you get into real estate and property. According to um, data from 100 of China's biggest real estate companies, the value of home sales in the month of December fell by 34.6% year over year. 
That was worse than the 29.6% year over year in November and 27.5% negative in October. So home prices and home sales and home values and home values of sales property sold, those continue to accelerate to the downside too. Again, in the face of everything that China's government is doing to try to turn the property sector and the economy around. It's not having the impact. And you go back to the, this data from the value of home sales from the biggest real, real estate companies, you saw a sharp increase in them in February, March, and April. But as soon as you hit May, when CNY really began to tank, which was an indication along with yields that the situation wasn't going well, China's real estate just rolled right back into more and more contraction. And the government has tried to stop the contraction. They've tried to do something, but it is not having any luck. And again, that's the question we have to ask here. There are two big problems here. One is why isn't China's government efforts having the, the effect that the government wants it to? And number two, what is really wrong with China? Now I answered both of those questions, but let's review it again. The second question, what's really wrong with China is post 2008 silent depression. They are attempting as best they can to live in this other world. The world before 2008, when the euro dollar system was working at its maximum, even above its maximum, maybe too well, was hugely beneficial to China more than any place else. It created a, a level of unparalleled prosperity in China as well as the rest of the world. That was great. But how does China or the rest of the world deal with a post-2008 world where the euro dollar system doesn't work in the same way. We deglobalize, we fragment, the economies don't grow in the same way, they don't grow at all. How does China deal with that? And they tried to deal with it with a real estate bubble, but without the actual legitimate recovery, they were only left with a real estate bubble. And now they have to do something about the real estate bubble. At the same time, they cannot count on anything from the global economy either in the short run or the long run. So you can understand the predicament here and why the Chinese are being ultra careful about everything they do. And at the same time, ultra careful means political as well as economic. We talked about all that intrigue in the Chinese government, the disappearing finance minister, defense minister, all that stuff. These are all related factors. China is the biggest risk the biggest likely contributor to destabilizing the global system in more ways than one, all because silent depression. We're stuck trying to live in it. And in some places, being stuck trying to live in it is more difficult than others. That's what China's economy in 2023 was telling us. That's the message. The silent depression was particularly hard to deal with in this post-2020 world in China more than anywhere else. So what does that mean in 2024? Well, we don't know yet. Obviously, we don't have a crystal ball, but the bond markets aren't very sanguine now, are they? For a deeper look at those economic woes in China, check out the video that's linked below me. The last statistics on the month of November, retail sales, industrial production, all that stuff, not good there. As always, I thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members and subscribers. And until next time, take care.